This is the final section of verses of the second major division of the book of Romans. If you don't count the introductory material, which is about 17 verses in chapter 1, you have the first section, which is about condemnation, laying out why every one of us is guilty before God and why we need the gospel in the first place. And to the end of chapter 5, you have the section on justification, which is all about how we are saved and what Jesus did and why that solves the problem that he laid out at the beginning of the book. And because he's talking about this universal human problem, Paul in these verses is going to give a universal human example to give one more illustration and one more explanation of what salvation is. And he's going to use the example of Adam, who, of course, is the father of us all. And we've been seeing as we've gone along, and I hope this has become very obvious to you, that Paul is paying very special attention to address issues related to the law of Moses, to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel as a whole. And what he's been trying to do is to explain, yes, it is the Jewish Messiah that has saved us. It is the Hebrew scriptures that have been fulfilled. But he's trying to make the point that this is a universal salvation. He's trying to take especially these Jewish Christians from thinking of their salvation in cultural terms to thinking of it in global, worldwide terms. We do that so naturally now. It would seem so odd for me to come up here and say salvation is only available to this certain group of people. Well, the reason you think that so naturally is because partly of the arguments that Paul is making here in Romans. So he's going to use one more universal example. Because the gospel is not a tribal or cultural religion. And as the accusation often comes today, it is not just another Western idea that has been pushed on the whole world. First of all, Jesus was from, Jeru from Israel, which is not in the Western world. And the, the center of Christianity has moved several times. It was in Africa for a long time, and it was in Syria for a long time, and then it was in Europe, and now it's been largely in America. And you can even see how it's transitioning over to places like Korea and Brazil, and you know who knows where it's going to go. It's a worldwide solution to a worldwide problem. If you are a child of Adam, which is all of you, <laughs> then you are a child of the first sinner, and you follow in his footsteps. And it is only, as Paul is going to lay out, by the last Adam, Jesus Christ, that you may be saved. And not only that, but this passage has a ton of little doctrinal nuggets for us to dig out. A lot of verses that inform other conversations that we have throughout Scripture. So we're going to get into some of those as well. Let's begin by starting at verse 12, and we'll go down to verse 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For indeed, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Okay, so as I said, Paul is coming to a big transition in the flow of the book here. So he's, he's summing it up. You learned how to write essays when you were in school. It's good to have a little summary paragraph before you move on to the next section. And he says, therefore, but I like the way the ESV punctuates it, that at the end of verse 12, there's a little dash, because Paul is going to be using this illustration to make his final point. And then he goes, let me make sure you understand exactly what I mean when I say that. And then in verse 18, he picks up the word therefore again. So it's not exactly a parenthesis, but it's, uh, it's, it's just interesting for me to see things like that, that he was going to conclude... And his, uh, you all know what I mean when I say that, right? Okay, anyway, in conclusion, which is sort of how I tend to preach sometimes. So it makes me feel pretty good. And he refers to the example of the fall, the fall of man from the Garden of Eden to draw a comparison between Adam and Jesus. Adam, of course, is a negative example and Jesus as a positive example. So in order to make sure we're properly able to understand this, I'm going to read uh, two significant portions from the book of Genesis that remind us of what the fall is. You might not know this story very well. So I'm going to read it, one from Genesis chapter 2 and then one from Genesis chapter 3. It says in Genesis 2, 15, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. 
For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. You shall surely die. So the Lord places Adam in the Garden of Eden. Eve would be created only a few verses later. He lays down the law, so to speak. You shall only eat of these trees, not of this one. And he lays down what the penalty will be, which is death. And then in Genesis chapter 3, this is after Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit, which they were not supposed to. The Lord said to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. And of course a few chapters later you know that Adam died. And so did Eve. This is the story of the fall, giving the short version without all the, the details. But God created a perfect world. He created a world apart from sin, apart from evil. And he placed man in his garden, which was called, called the Garden of Eden, to tend it. And it wasn't just live in this garden and never leave. God said there's a whole world out there for you to fill and, and make something of. It was the ideal situation, but the Lord told them, you are not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are certain things that the Lord did not want us to experience. There's certain knowledge that was not to be gained. Of course, the knowledge of evil. And it was that act of rebellion that brought sin into the world, which is Paul says here in verse 12, sin came into the world through one man. And we could go off on a long discussion for another time of why would God even put that tree there? Well, because the Lord desired to have a real relationship with people. Real love without choice is not real love. That's just being kidnapped. That's just being a robot, right? So the Lord put that out there, and, and we did sin, and here we are today. And if you're interested in that, we've already taught through the whole book of Genesis. You can go on the website, and you can go check that out. But it was that rebellion that brought sin into the world, and as God warned him in chapter 2, verse 17 of Genesis, sin leads to death. We've talked about this quite a bit going through this, this book, that sin leads to death. Here's one little side note that I, I said there's a lot of these. Here's one of them. We accept the historicity of the story of Adam and the fall in the Garden of Eden. There are those, and it's, it seems to be increasing lately, who cannot, cannot uh, what's the word? cannot reconcile the, the modern scientific consensus with the book of Genesis. And so, of course, which one gets tossed out the window? It's, it's not going to be the science. It's going to be the, the scripture. And there's plenty of ways to answer those questions. But there are even those that have said, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it happened this way. It doesn't matter if it was created. They'll say, it doesn't matter if the story of Genesis 1 is all wrong. As long as we know that God made the world, who cares about the details? There are others who say, it doesn't matter if there was a real Adam or not. As long as we know that we're sinners, that's all that matters. But I want you to see here that Paul is hanging doctrine, gospel doctrine, on the existence of a man named Adam. Adam is not just a symbolic figure. The gospels will trace Jesus' genealogy back to the man, Adam. So this is not the main point of the day. It just is important to know that you can't just look at the Bible and say, this part can't be true. But as long as we get the point, it's okay if we don't believe it. You keep doing that and you wind up by saying things like it doesn't matter if Jesus rose from the dead or not. And then you're in serious trouble. So every child of Adam and Eve inherited that curse that they received on that day. Chapter 3 has a big long list of the punishment that was coming upon them. And every child that came after has followed in their footsteps. He says, death spread to all men because all sinned. Every one of us now has a sin nature, as we say, a sinful heart that bears sinful fruit. Every little baby that is born has a sinful nature. And people who don't have children really don't like that statement. No, children are perfect and wonderful and glorious and Aren't they sweet? And then you have children. And you, go, you learn very quickly. You don't have to teach them to lie. You don't, now, listen, if you, do, if you do something and you're going to get in trouble, just say you didn't do it. And the baby goes, oh, no, no, no. They know. And it's great. When they're real little, they don't know how to cover up their face. And so they're like, did you do that? No. Like, did you do that? Yes. And, you know, then they break down. And they get better at it. You don't have to teach them to be selfish. 
You don't need to see the child. No, take that and say it's yours. Take his toys. Go on, take them. Really? Yeah, take them and say, no, children know that. It's from within them. Children are not, children are not, what's the word, selfless. Children really don't care if you're sleeping and it's 3 o'clock in the morning and they want to get up. My children will do that sometimes. They'll like, like, what's wrong? It's like, I don't know. Well, go back to bed. I don't want to. Why? I don't know. Well, it's not very considerate of them. And listen, I love my kids. Don't get me wrong. But the whole point is children are sinful and they need parents to work some of that out of them by the time we turn them loose on the rest of the world. And those people that don't do that we're not very pleased with them, are we? Nobody can beg off being a sinner. Well, no, I'm not a sinner. Or they say, it's not fair that I inherit sin from Adam. Some people will get real bent out of shape by that. They'll say, no, you, I can't be punished for what he did. Well, you're right. But what does Paul say? All sinned. Like, that might work for somebody. It doesn't work for you because you've done the same kind of things. We're all guilty, not only because we are born sinners, but because we commit sins. You don't, and by the way, committing sins does not make you a sinner. You commit sins because you are a sinner. It comes out of you. Sometimes what's in you surprises you. You're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off and something comes out of your mouth and you go, whoa, where did that come from? I didn't know that was in me. Well, it was. David understood this. In Psalm 51.5, he said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. All of us are born into sin because of what Adam did. And all of us commit the same sins, so we cannot say it's not fair that I'm getting punished for what someone else did. You're getting punished for what you have done. And in verse 13, there's this interesting little verse. He says, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Here again, he's addressing a Jewish concern, because remember, the church at this point was almost completely Jewish Christians. And the big theme of the New Testament is how are we going to integrate all of these Gentiles into the church? And they might say, now wait a minute, how can you say that Adam was the one that brought sin into the world when there was no law yet? The law is what defines what's sinful, right? How can you count sin apart from the law? And some of y'all made a face at me just now because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. But you've got to remember how ingrained this was culturally to them. That there is no standard of right and wrong other than the law. Which is why chapter 2 was all about it doesn't matter what your standard is, you still can't meet it. Well, Paul just states an obvious truth. Of course sin was there before the law. Because death was there before Moses. If the wages of sin is death and people were dying before Moses, then of course of course there was sin before Moses. These are hard truths for these Jews to receive. He keeps on taking them back. Have you noticed this? Before Moses. He takes them back to Abraham. He takes them back to Adam. He's got to remind them that there is something universal going on here that absolutely Moses was a significant and integral part of. We'll talk about that more a little later. But he needs to say sin is something that occurs to everybody. What was the point of the law? It was to mark and identify sin, to increase sin, to increase its awareness. But when he says sin is not counted where there is no law, don't, don't think that he's saying sins don't count if there's no law. It, it's, it's a different point that he's going to make that we're going to return to. Death reigned, verse 14, because we all die. Death reigned even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. I'm not as bad as him. I didn't break the world and kick us out of the Garden of Eden. Why am I getting punished? The wages of sin is death. What matters is that it is in you. And maybe you've never been brought to the place where you're brought to the edge of who you are and had to confront what you will do when the chips are down. And you ought to be on your knees before the Lord, letting him bring you there in prayer and in the church and in worship before that comes so that you're prepared when the moments arrive. But you've seen when, when people are hungry, when people are thirsty, when people are desperate, they will do things that they never would have contemplated before. And that's what is being punished by death. And he calls Adam a type of the one who was to come. This is an important concept for us to grasp, so let's take some time and talk about it. A type, what does that mean? This is an argument from what is called typology. The word typology, the word type, comes from the Greek word tupas, which comes from the, the verb which means to strike. You would, you would make a type on a coin. You would strike the image onto the coin. 
And doctrinally, when you're we're talking about typology, this is an interpretation of Scripture that is made through comparison, through foreshadowing, and through parallel. There are many figures, especially in the Old Testament, who prefigure what was going to happen in the church or in Christ Jesus. For example, Paul is using Adam as an example of somebody that did one thing that affected everybody. In the same way, Jesus did one thing that affected everybody. He's going to break this down a little further. Let me give you a few examples of types that we have in Scripture. Joseph is a type of Christ. How so? Well, look at this. Joseph was the only righteous one among his brothers. He was betrayed by his brothers. He was cast down into the pit. He came up out of the pit and was seated at the right hand of the, of the power in that time. His brothers then came to him, bowing the knee, and he gave them all forgiveness instead of punishing them. Kind of like Jesus was, right? The righteous one, betrayed by his brothers, thrown down into the earth, came out of the pit and sat down at the right hand of the Father and now offers forgiveness to all of us. Isn't that cool? A little parallel of Joseph and Jesus. What about Moses? Moses, who came and brought, and uh, I'm going to lose this one. Moses, who came back and led his people out of the land, out of, the, out of Egypt, across the water, into the desert, and into the promised land. Just as Jesus came down to us in our slavery, liberated us, brought us through the waters of baptism, and is now leading us through the wilderness to the promised land someday. Jesus and Israel, the nation of Israel, have a whole ton of parallels. Jesus also came out of Egypt, didn't he? He had to flee to Egypt until, he was, until Herod had died. He comes back to Egypt. Jesus was in the wilderness and then passed through the Jordan River to come back into the land and proclaim forgiveness. There's a whole bunch of these. The, the great one is Isaac, who's being sacrificed on the mountain. Remember that? Isaac was the only son of his father who was going to be sacrificed on that mountain until the Lord said, Stop. I, the Father, will send my only Son to be sacrificed on this mountain in his place. This is all over the Old Testament, and the New Testament draws these things out. This is a legitimate form of Bible study, and I believe a legitimate form of interpretation. There are those that will say things like, we should never draw out a typology unless the New Testament draws it out. Usually that comes because people don't believe that typology is a legitimate way to interpret Scripture. I have found but you can go a little nuts with this. And you can start to say, well, because it happened here, it had to happen here. And because he did it, I'm allowed to do it. Well, yeah, you've got to watch out for that kind of thing. It can be taken to extremes. But that's typology. You'll see this sometimes. We've been going through Exodus on uh, Wednesday nights, and there is all over the Bible, all over the place. Today's point is that Adam was a single man whose actions had an effect on every other living person, plunging us into sin and thereby into death. And that Jesus was a single man whose actions also had an effect on every living person, taking us out of sin, out of death, and into life. Because we all are in sin. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who's unclean. All our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Leaves are starting to fall. You hear them skittering along the driveway out front, right? That's what your righteous deeds are like. Oh, they look great at the time, but they wither and they fall off, and then the wind blows them away. That's what Adam has brought to us. We were born into sin, and then we live lives of sin. And then at the end, we reap the death penalty of sin. That's that bad news that we spend a lot of time going over, right? Reframing it in terms of Adam. We are children of Adam and bearers of his curse. So Adam is the type and Christ is the anti-type, as it's called. So we move into verse 15, down to verse 17. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Can you see these, these comparisons that he's making back and forth? He moves on to the anti-type. He's comparing the cross to the fall, the act of crucifixion and resurrection to the fall. And I, I just love 
what he says in verse 15. And I could preach just that first sentence. The free gift is not like the trespass. What's the thing that Adam did that affects us all? His trespass. He broke the law. But what is it that Jesus did? It's a free gift. Gospel is a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Not a gift you've got to pay for. It's not a gift that's free now, no down payment, no interest for 30 days, and then you, can, you pick it up and start paying for it later. It's a free gift. No works required. And these are unlike each other. They are opposites. So he says, it's not like several times. It's not like. Because the work of Jesus is not only the opposite and the inverse, but it's greater than that of Adam. So let's look at these three contrasts that he draws out in these verses. Three different ways he contrasts Jesus' work with Adam's. And the first is the difference between death and grace. For if many died through the one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man abounded for many. Death versus grace. Death is the morbid shadow hanging over every day of your life. Death is coming for us all. And we can go long stretches without thinking about it, especially when you're young. But then you get that phone call. Once you've gotten the phone call that someone you love has died, it, it affects every other phone call you get out of the blue, doesn't it? When I was young, I was in high school, I had, high school and college, I had three or four, yeah, four friends of mine that died in, in pretty quick succession to one another. And getting those phone calls and that text message, it's every time the phone rang after that, your heart skips a beat. Like, what now? What's happened now? And then, you know, you get over that and you move on. But as you grow and as you get older, it occupies more space in your mind. When you're driving and you have a really near miss, and you're like, that could have been terrible. We just had a tree fall down and, and smash into our house the other night. The loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. Sound like a locomotive coming through our dining room. And I, was, I have not been so scared, and I yelled so loud. And Catelyn didn't even hear it. She screamed too, and I didn't hear her. That's how loud this thing was. But you just you think, like, that could have been. What if that had fallen just a little more this way? And what if Josie and May had been in her room when that was falling down this way? You think about that. It's that shadow that hangs over your whole life. That's what Adam has brought. But what does Christ bring? He brings grace. He brings grace. We talked about this. It means favor. That you no longer have to live under the shadow of death anymore. Uh, David said, though I walk through the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. And now the Lord is definitely with each of us. We read those great psalms and go, but does this apply to me? Yeah, it does. You have the grace of God, the free gift. You've been given the favor of God. And now what covers your life is not the imminent fear of death and what comes after, but the knowledge that you have been accepted by God. And that even when death comes, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. That changes your whole perspective on life, doesn't it? The second contrast, condemnation versus justification. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. This is that legal metaphor that Paul has been using throughout Romans. You stand condemned before God. If you are in sin, if you are a child of Adam on judgment day, you will not be acquitted. You will be condemned. The Lord has let us know ahead of time what it's going to be. And that's what stands. The Lord said, the day you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. And death is coming for us all. Not just death now, but death forever in hell. But the cross has enabled you to be justified before God. Because on the cross, Jesus took the wrath of God. He took the curse upon himself. The Bible says that Jesus became a curse for us so that we could be liberated and justified. And remember that, that phrase, counted righteous. That when you show up into heaven, you're in the righteous column. Even though you're not, God's going to treat you that way because he loves you. And he says, Jesus has already paid that price. That eliminates guilt. And the shadow of death is one thing that can wreck your life. But how about guilt over things you've done? Guilt over things. You know, I'm just going to speak to my own experience a little bit here. I think ladies have a better, do a better job of getting guilt off their shoulders than fellas do. Because ladies, you know, you, you talk with one another. You, you communicate. You speak to each other. You speak to your husband, to your friends, and things that you feel terrible about. Y'all are really good at that, and you're always telling your husbands to be better at that, right? Men will hang on to things. 
And men can be, I mean, for years and decades, guilty things that keep us awake and cause us to get out of bed in the middle of the night and pace around in the, in the hallway and go into the backyard and breathe deeply because we still feel guilty about it. I'm not saying that this, one of these is right or wrong. I just know how that can feel when you've done something. When you speak to somebody that is, is decades separated from the thing they did and still can't get over it. I know teenagers. And you think, what can a teenager do that is so terrible? Well, not a whole lot, but when you're young, you know that everything is magnified and everything is much worse. And who feel like, I don't deserve to have a good life. I don't deserve to be with a good person. I don't deserve to be healthy. And I know guys and girls that would hurt themselves and starve themselves and deliberately get into relationships with people who are going to hurt them because of guilt, whether it was deserved or not. But in the cross, all that's wiped away. Amen. There's no more guilt for you. You're set free. That's why the Bible says he who is set free is free indeed. And Jesus said, whoever is forgiven much, loves much. When you know what you've done, you know the depths of your own sin, and the Lord forgives you of that, that person is going to cling so tightly to Jesus, you're never going to shake them free. Condemnation versus justification. And the third contrast, the reign of death versus our reign in life. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the man, Jesus Christ. When you are a child of Adam, death reigns. Death is king. There's an Old Testament picture where it refers to a, a false god that was worshipped. It was the, the god of that era called Mot. He was the death god. And he was depicted in, in all of his uh, idols and on all of the literature they wrote about him as, as having a giant mouth that swallows everything, that one lip extended to heaven and the other lip extended down into hell. And you can see the image there, right? Death swallows up everything. Which is why when you read those passages in the Old and New Testament that say death is swallowed up in victory, that's, that's making a really big point. That the Lord says, no way. My people are not going to live the rest of their lives under the shadow of death. Instead, not as death is not going to reign over you. You are going to reign in life. You're bound by death in Adam, but in Christ you reign in life. What does that mean? It means that life is now your domain. Just like God was trying to give Adam the whole world to explore and live in and make something great out of, that's yours now in Christ Jesus. Life is yours to be lived by his righteousness. You are no longer under the authority of the existential horror of the world. Life is now open to you. There is joy and peace and celebration available to you in Christ. So can you see that progression there? Now that death has been handled, which is the end of your life, and your guilt has been handled, which is this life, everything now is just, it's wonderful. It's like when Dorothy goes to Oz and it goes from black and white to color. It's like the whole world is just different now. It's better in Christ Jesus. It's a greater work that Jesus has done. Because it's easy to break something. If you ever worked with Legos, you know what I'm talking about. It takes a long time to put something together. It's much easier to break it. Adam broke the world. But Jesus Christ came in and did something much harder, which was to restore the world. He's working something better, something more wonderful for us. And you can see Paul is already moving towards the next section here, which is about sanctification. That you've been saved, what happens in your life now? He's already making this pivot here by saying that we reign in life. And I love that. We've got to get this because we can be really grumpy in our religion as Christians, which makes no sense. We've been talking a lot about joy lately and I was thinking to myself last night, I'm like, are we going to really talk about joy again? Yes, we are. You can never have too many messages on joy. Because so many Christians are deceived into thinking that joy and happiness are marks of immaturity. The opposite of that is true. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Abundant life. Sin and death hang over your life as these ominous intrusions. But when you have the free gift of righteousness, all that's handled. And the world opens up. Being a Christian is not just about the fear of hell, but having a real desire for life. That every moment is full of all the wonder and joy that you can pack into it. 
And then we get all religious, like, well, we really ought to be getting out there and, and doing more church things. And yeah, okay, but what about your life? God doesn't just expect, okay, now that you're saved, spend all your free time at church and don't ever have fun again. That's not salvation. That is not what is. First Timothy 6, the Bible says, God has given us all things richly to enjoy. How's that? The Lord has given you everything you've got to enjoy it. I, just, I keep on going back to these kinds of examples, but when I was a kid, it used to make me crazy sometimes because I would play my, my GameCube or my video games, whatever it was, and every now and then my dad would come down and say, turn that thing off. You've played enough today. And I'd be like, but dad, didn't you give me this thing richly to enjoy? <laughs> That's a silly example, but you get the point, don't you? Because God doesn't come along telling you that you've had enough, fooled it around enough for one day. Go out and be miserable thinking about the state of the world. God goes, hey, wh why are you feeling so bad about all the things that I've given you? Why are you so reluctant to have a good time? Why do you feel like when you, when you talk to other Christians, you've got you to gotta apologize for your vacation or something like that? Oh, yeah, we went down to the Gulf and had a great time. And I, I know that children are starving in Africa, but, you know, I, I think we needed a break. Yeah. God has given you all things richly to enjoy. Mark 7, 15, here's a crazy one. Jesus said, nothing that goes into a person can defile him, but only what comes out of him. He was telling this to the Pharisees that had all these rules about what you could and couldn't do. And Jesus is like, why are you acting like the world is just waiting to defile you? And we've got to be careful, because if I touch that, I might, I might become unclean. I might become sinful again. The Bible says in one place that you sanctify things when you use them. That it's the opposite. Rather than, you know, I get letters all the time from people who think that you can accidentally worship the devil. It, it's the weirdest thing. Like, you know, do you know, I, you, you celebrate Christmas. You know that if you have a Christmas tree, you're actually worshiping Satan. It's like, excuse me? Or be like, you know, if you, if you do it, you're, you might secretly take the mark of the beast. Like, nobody's accidentally taking the mark of the beast. Give me a break. In fact, the Bible says when you go out into the world, what you use is sanctified. It doesn't affect you because you touched it. You affect it by being there. You turn things around you into holy things by engaging in them. How about that? That's a different perspective on life, isn't it? That, that goes from this restrictive, don't do that thing, to this expansive, there's the world. There's the promised land. Go out and enjoy it. And 1 Peter 1, 8 says that we rejoice in Christ with joy inexpressible. So full of joy, I can't even tell you. And, and for some reason, we can get like that where we think, well, yes, joy is, is nice, but we also have got to be very sober and remember all the terrible things that are going on in the world. And, you know, that's kind of where we're all stuck at this point in our culture, aren't we? Everything is terrible. There's an old Muppets episode where, remember Sam the Eagle, who they use him to make fun of like politics and things like that. And there was one scene where he's like on a, like a Fox News or CNN type show. He goes, welcome back to everything stinks. <laughs> like that's kind of how things are now. Like everything's bad. We're looking at the worst possible situa situation and this is going to make the whole culture fall apart and this is going to wreck our government and this is going to wreck my life. And the Bible goes, you have inexpressible joy. Why are you letting that stuff get to you? Because it's serious. Yeah, okay, it's serious. Jesus lived under Roman occupation. There were soldiers marching through the streets, taking people's money. All right? that, that, it was not a good time. And yet he walks around talking about joy. He says, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Uh, very clearly, Jesus just doesn't understand the severity of the situation. And it's really not fair for those who have been hurt by that. Jesus is like, this stuff's always going to be there. There's always going to be problems. This one will get solved, then something else will come up. Go out and find the joy that God has given to you. And don't feel bad about it. Oh, man, people have told me, I'll preach on joy. And we'll get an email from somebody saying, you really seem to be minimizing and downplaying how serious the situation is in the world. To which I would say, you seem to be minimizing and downplaying what Christ Jesus has done for you on the cross and through the empty tomb. Isn't that true? That thing is so much greater. It's above everything else. and Everything else just shrivels up. In comparison, we've got to be careful in the church not to rebuild fear and grief because we're afraid of collateral damage. Well, if I tell people that they sanctify things by their use, they might go out and become a drug addict. So, so then what? We're never going to tell people what the Bible says about God's grace? 
Paul's going to get into that in the next chapter. He's going to say, we're not going to continue in sin that grace may abound, but we should never restrict the teaching of God's freedom and grace so that we can keep people in line. That's what the Pharisees did. The Lord said, don't do that. So they built the line all the way back here to make sure nobody accidentally did it. And they made people miserable. And they made people not want to come to the Lord. Galatians, Paul said, for freedom, Christ has set us free. For freedom. Why were you saved? So that you could be free. So, so don't submit to a yoke of slavery. If somebody comes along wanting to put this religious yoke around your neck, you say, no, no, no. I'm free in Christ Jesus. I'm free indeed in Christ Jesus. Because if you're a child of Adam, yes, you face death. But if you're a child of God, you're free indeed. Let's keep going. Verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience many were made sinners, by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now he's coming back to that therefore that we left behind in verse 12. He says, I'm going to use this example of Adam. Y'all know what I'm talking about with, with Adam, right? About how, okay, yeah, you got it. All right, therefore. And he comes back in verse 18. And this verse 18 is a really great example of how typology works. Adam had one act that led to death for all. Jesus has one act that leads to life for all. He used this in 1 Corinthians as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. This is why we call Christ the last Adam. The last Adam. The name Adam means man. He was the son of man who reversed and restored what was lost. Now let's get into one, one more of these little doctrinal things here. It says all several times here. Condemnation for all men. Justification and life for all men. And then in verse uh, 19, it says, many will be. And then many will be. Is this teaching universal salvation? Because this is one of those verses. People get cute and they say, all means all. And it says that all will receive the life. All right. Let's back up to a passage that is not disputed. Luke 13, verses 23 through 24. Someone said to Jesus, Lord... Will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. What's he saying? Yes. It's a narrow door. It's a narrow path. And not many will be saved. You look at the book of Revelation where it talks about that there was the chosen few that were saved. Very clear that not all will be saved. In fact, most will not be saved. How then do you get this verse where he says all well, there's one answer that some people put out that I also don't agree with. They, they put out what's called limited atonement. This is one of the five points of Calvinism. And listen, Calvinism's got a lot of great points to say. This is not one of them. Limited atonement. The idea that Jesus only died for the elect. He only died for the Christians. He did not die for everybody else. And this is an attempt mostly to spare Jesus Christ some embarrassment. Well, if Jesus Christ died for somebody and then they didn't get saved, doesn't that mean that Christ died for nothing and somehow he doesn't have all power? No. But if you're so tied up in that, that uh, system of theology, you can, you can fall into that. It's very clear that Jesus died for everybody. 2 Corinthians 5, twice in that passage, it says Christ died for all. John 12, 32, Jesus said, When the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So if you do not believe that anybody can reject salvation, you have a problem. But if you believe, as, as I do and as we do here, that you, you need to respond in faith to what the Lord is offering you. And if you reject the Lord, you will not be saved. Is that a mystery? Yes. But there it is in Scripture. Christ died for all. Christ died for all. So what's the point here? If Jesus died for everybody, but you know not everybody's going to be saved, what are we talking about here? I love the way this was put. I think this was Millard Erickson that said it this way, that salvation is available for everybody, but it will only be effective for those who believe. Anybody can be saved. There's nobody that is beyond salvation. Oh, Jesus Christ didn't die for folks in Japan. Sorry. That doesn't work that way. Anybody may be saved anywhere. This is the point Paul's trying to make, that just as Adam's sin spreads to all, Christ's death can spread to all as well, if you will believe, if you will receive it. 
Whoever is dead in sin is able to be made alive. Isn't that cool? Who can be saved? Well, anybody who's a sinner because of Adam. That's everybody. Yes, it is. Nobody is beyond saving. Not even you. Some of y'all are stuck and say, God can never save me because of what I've done. Yes, he can. There's nobody that is beyond salvation. God has saved terrorists and cheating spouses and violent people. God has saved everybody. He can save you. So this is important to know. Christ died for all. This does not mean that everybody's going to be saved. The Bible very clearly doesn't teach that. Nor does it believe that, I mean, in fact, it says that right there, that Jesus didn't actually die for everybody. Very, one of the most, I think, clear points of the New Testament is that Jesus Christ died for the whole world. But you also have to believe. So we've gone through this here, and this, this passage is kind of summing up what we've learned so far in the book of Romans. First section of Romans was condemnation. This was chapter 1, verse 18, to chapter 3, verse 20. This is that summed up in that whole big, no one is righteous, none, not one. We are all going to hell apart from Christ. That's the first point. You're unrighteous for God because you're a sinner and your punishment is death. And then from chapter 3, verse 21, chapter 5, verse 21, justification. This is the doctrine that Christ's death paid your penalty and God is offering you righteousness freely as a free gift if you will believe. Justification. This is where we are so far in Romans. And verses 20 and 21 are the pivot that are going to move us into the next section in chapter 6. So let's read those now. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He returns to the subject of the law here. It seems like he's opening up a new subject. He kind of is, but it's really an old one. The point of the law before was that it's not enough to have the law. You have to keep the law. And he made the point that nobody could keep the law. So if you're a Jewish Christian reading this book, you're saying, then what's the point of the law in the first place? He tells us the law was there to expose our weakness. When the rules are in front of you, you are more aware of your sin and more likely to sin. I tell a little kid, don't touch that. They're, they might have never thought of touching it, but now, well, why not? Maybe I should touch it. What are they trying to keep from me? I love telling the story. We went to a cabin in the woods for a... Uh, just a little time away, my family and I, and Micah was like one, or just toddling around, and it was a hot wood-burning stove. And I told him, don't touch the stove, it's hot. And he kept on walking over, and I kept, no, 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 no. But, you know, he was a persistent little dude, and still is. And uh, finally I told Catlin, I said, I'm not, I'm not going to stop him next time. I'm going to let him touch it. Because he wasn't putting his hand like on the thing, it was the handle, so, you know, I was, I was being careful. But he went out there, and he touched it, and of course, pss, ah! And, you know, Micah is an angry crier. So I pay, it's okay, buddy, it's okay. And he picks up his hand, he turns around to the stove and yelled at it like, ah, how dare you? That's what the law does. Don't do that. Well, why not? Say, I want you to go the rest of your life without lying. Hey, no problem, man. And then by day three, we may have a problem. I can't stop lying. I can't stop coveting. I can't stop sinning. That's what the law does. The law's purpose was to reveal to the whole world, yeah, you are under sin. So that when Jesus Christ came, they didn't have to stop and explain. You know, you see, you're not a perfect person. Everybody gets it. Now, of course, everybody says, just embrace that you're not perfect. That's what makes life wonderful. No, it's not. Isn't that a silly thing to say? Not being imperfect is what makes life great. Yeah, like if you're rich, maybe. Oh, no, I, for, I, I accidentally did that. I'm so sorry. But what about if, like, you're living in... The, the you know, middle of India or something like that. And there are people that are abusing your family and coming around and beating your family and taking your, your kids away. And yeah, yeah, oh, imperfections make the world so much better, right? The law existed to reveal sin to us. Paul talks about that in Galatians. We don't have time for that today, but he spends a lot of time talking about that. Read through the commandments of the law. Because you ever thought that you're perfect now? Go read through those commandments, and you'll know that you're not. And why is that alarming? Well, because there's a death penalty attached to the law. The soul that sins shall surely die, Ezekiel said. 
But the gospel gives us a whole new perspective on sin. Because as sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's another one of those, how can you say that, Paul? He says, Paul, I sinned again. He goes, hey, that just means there's a more grace covering your life. It doesn't sound like you're taking this very seriously. He goes, oh, yes, I am. I just understand what salvation means. That grace abounds even more. That you can look at your past life and not have to cover it up. This is why as Christians, we'll stand up and give testimonies. And tell everybody about all the stuff that we used to do. Normally, like, just keep that to yourself, bro. Don't. <laughs> Why am I telling this? Because that means the grace of God has overflowed for me, and it can overflow for you, too. The gospel changes people. And that sounds bad, and that's actually going to be the next thing he talks about is, whoa, whoa, whoa. Where sin abounds, grace abounds, or you're saying I should just sin all the time? That's chapter 6. Of course not, is the answer. Grace reigns now, not death or sin, but righteousness and eternal life. Grace. And it's really hard to talk too much about these verses without getting into the next chapter, but the whole point that he's been making from, from chapter 3, verse 21 on is grace covers your life now. Because of what Jesus has done, you're not, you're not living under the same burdens as everybody else in Christ Jesus. If only I could believe that. You must believe that. You should believe that. If you're in Christ... You don't need to say, oh, okay, I'm saved, I'm in, just be careful. Because I'm in by the skin of my teeth, and God might just flick me out if I, if I do something wrong. Grace, abounding grace over your life. Forgiveness and peace and joy. We've gone from condemnation, that we're all sinners, to justification. Christ can save you. If you're a child of Adam, you are a sinner under the penalty of death. But if you have faith in Christ then you are righteous, and life opens up for you. So Christian, take joy in your life, and don't fall into this depressed, angry kind of religion that we all seem to favor so much. I don't know why. It's not unique to us or our time. It's always kind of been the way. But the human condition has been solved by Jesus Christ. How about a smile, right? The last Adam has delivered us from what the first Adam brought upon us.